Chang is an inspiring young conservationist who's just completed her MPhil in conservation leadership at the University of Cambridge. And she's been working on a number of exciting initiatives to engage other young people, both in Africa and Asia, in wildlife conservation. Please give Chang a warm welcome. So Chang, we need to know how you got involved in conservation. Where did it all start for you? Um, well, when I was small, um, I was interested in being outdoor and natural world. And I remember I always stay up really late to watch David Attenborough National Documentaries on the TV. Because in Vietnam, no one interested in that kind of document. So they only put it on at midnight. So I normally just sneak up at 11 or 12, uh, try to watch the video. And I remember at the time, people, including my family, my friends, or my teacher, think that I was kind of really weird and crazy. Why do you want to have a career in conservation? Why do you want to go out and save animals? You, they think that it's useless. Um, but then I keep carry on and I just think that it's really important to protecting the animal because where I grow up, I see how wild animals being treated. I see they being kept in a small cage and being sold as a pet or being um, killed for meat or medicines. Um, and then I was really lucky to get a, a volunteer work in conservation when I was around 14. And I come to England to do my undergraduate in wildlife conservation. I have my first master in primate conservation. And last year, I started my MPhil in conservation leadership. And I managed to uh, found my own small organizations in conservation in Vietnam. Last year. Fantastic, that's a really great story. And do you still feel that in Vietnam today, conservation is seen as something a little bit strange? It is still being considered something quite strange, but people, more people are interested in it now, especially young people. Um, for example, I have my own blog where I write about my experience when I'm doing field work or what I learned from wildlife and what I learned in conservation. And I got a lot of feedback from young people in Vietnam, students. And sometimes I even get a um, letter from young mother asking, how did you involve in conservation? How did you get where you are? If my children want to be a conservationist like you, then what can I do for them? So I think it's getting a lot better now in Vietnam. Thanks to all of the NGO been working so hard in Vietnam trying to raise awareness in conservation. It sounds like you're being a real inspiration for the next generation as well. That's really good news. Now, we know about the demand for rhino horn being quite high in countries like Vietnam. What do you believe can be done to reduce the demand? Well, for rhino horn in Vietnam, um, they use it for a lot of different purposes. For example, um, rich people want to use it to show up how wealthy they are. People who work in the government or business, they use it as a kind of bribery. You can buy it because it's so expensive. You give it to your boss to get what you want. Or some people use it to, for uh, medication purpose. And it's really difficult when you come out and talk to people because, for example, in Vietnam, there's around 82,000 people having cancer every year. The hospital, the cancer hospital in Vietnam is only packed with so many people and they don't even have enough room for cancer patients anymore. So when I come and talk to people and they all say, well, you are conservationists, you get paid to say what you're saying to us. Rhino horn must have some effect. Or they can say, like, if you have cancer, you would do everything you can to get rid of it. Um, so last year, I um, was diagnosed with cancer. And it made me even more determined to come out and say, well, you know what, when I have cancer, I go to hospital and get proper treatment, and that's how the cancer goes away. Do not use rhino horn. And I hope that I can use my story as an example to give to, to, to people, and they will trust me with that. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's really, uh, it's, a, it's a brave and inspiring reaction to some very frightening news that you had. And how are you feeling now? How, how are things going? I feel really good, especially today sitting here and talking to everyone. <laughs> 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 and how, how's the, the prognosis for you, for your cancer treatment? Um, so I had my um, scan last week and I will hear about the result by December, so finger crossed. That's good. You let us know, won't you? Yeah. Um, now what about, the, there's, there's, a, there's a value, there's a very high value placed yeah. on rhino horn. Um, do you get any resistance when you're trying to educate people in the fact that it's, it, it shouldn't be used for things like cancer treatment? What, yeah. what resistance is there? 
Yes, um, so, so for example, when we do our um, campaign to Vietnam raising awareness to the public, I would say I would form them into four, three different groups. The first group is the elder people who uh, really believe in traditional and cultural values, who would not care about scientific evidence, and they would say, I don't care what happened to the rhino. Vietnam have no rhino anymore, and it doesn't affect my life, so I don't care. Um, the second group is the people who uh, have belief in um, traditional culture, they would not completely believe that rhino horn can kill everything, but they do not also do not completely believe in scientific evidence saying that rhino horn cannot kill disease. Um, that for example, they would say to you like, if rhino horn is not an, uh, effective at all, then why it had been used in traditional medicine for thousands of years and it had been recorded in the books. Um, and the third group is a group of really young people, students, mostly students are very passionate about conservation, very passionate about saving the rhinos. And my work in Vietnam is trying to first creating more opportunity for the people, the young people in the third group to get involved in conservation and to be more understanding of the issue and also try to persuade the people in the second group to believe in scientific evidence and stand on our side. Sounds like a real challenge, yeah. Um, what are the, can you talk to me more about the, the work that you're doing with young people, with the students? Yes, yeah, so um, for example, for my research placement, I um, work with um, Fauna Flora Internationals and uh, Opesita Conservancy when I do the both work in Kenya and in Vietnam, try to understand the teacher and student attitude be toward rhino conservation. Um, I try to understand what can be done to make them more engaged in rhino conservation. And it's really good in Opesita Conservancy. For example, they have a bus program where they take the local student into the conservancy, seeing them buy rhinos and learn about the rhinos. In Vietnam, obviously, we don't, we have, we don't have that yet because all of the school doesn't have any good connection with any of the national parks or, or natural reserve. So we can't take the student out to see the wife and we have no rhino left anymore. Um, so I started a campaign in Vietnam called Rhino Art Campaign and it's one of the international campaigns as well where we use art for the student to express their idea about conservation. They can draw what they want um, where they see the rhino in the, next, in the future, what can be done to save the rhinos. And we managed to select six students to go to South Africa for the one rhino submit. And the students, they got so excited, they see the wild rhinos in South Africa. They get to talk with students from 20 other countries in the world, come together, brainstorming, giving each other idea, learning about, the, um, about rhino and conservation. And they really, really looking forward to that when they go back to their countries, they can do something for the rhinos. That's fantastic news. Do you believe your work is really going to change attitudes then? Yes, I do. Um, I really believe in young people. For example, for my um, rhino art campaign in Vietnam, I got a letter from a student, secondary school student, she's about 13, and she was saying her own story that in her family, her uncles, own been using rhino horn for a long time. Um, he used it for everything for curing his fever or, um, or to, just to make himself stronger. And she said before that she don't know what is happening, why, is it, why everyone wants to use rhino horns. All she knows is it's really expensive. But now after joining the campaign, she learned about the rhino. She learned that using rhino horn actually pushing the rhino to extinction. She learned that it's affecting a lot of people in Africa. And she was saying that she promised she would talk to her uncle until he stopped using rhino horn because he, she was saying that would be the biggest reward for her, that her uncle, when he get ill, he get a proper treatment in the hospital rather than wasting money on rhino horn. And I think that was, that's great. That would be the biggest reward for us conservationists as well. And those yeah. personal stories are obviously the most powerful ones as well. Yeah. yeah. Now, tell me a little bit about this online computer game, because I understand that you recently lent your voice to a, a, an online computer game. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that works? Yeah, well, that um, really wonderful and uh, strange experience for me, seeing myself as a character in the game, running around with a rhino. Um, so it was so like... Just to explain, you're a character in a computer game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, it was a um, competition by, organized by United for Wildlife and seven other conservation organizations, including FFI, um, to tackle the wildlife threat with um, Royal Foundations. Um, so there was around 220 million players playing this online game. 
and the player would have to talk to my character, answering several questions about rhino and rhino conservations, um, and they can win a royal rhinos in, in the game. Um, there was around nearly 1.5 million questions about rhino was answered in just a few days. And uh, we also have a Q&A online section, so the player can talk to conservationists and rhino experts to get more deep understanding about what's happening to the rhinos, and it was really successful. What a brilliant idea. Now, is the future for rhinos just virtual rhinos in a computer game, or do you, are you really hopeful that we can stop rhinos from becoming extinct? I'm really hopeful that we can stop rhinos from going extinct, because, like I said, if we have the young people <coughs> talking together and learn about the rhino, and they have a sort of powerful voice that if they speak loud enough, their voice will be heard and things will change. Fantastic. Chang, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.